Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, May 15th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for May 15th, 2023. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log in to GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. Let's see. Just mute someone quick. It's not like We're not actually driving anywhere, yeah. just so anybody knows. <laughs> it looks like it was just muted there. If you're participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you're participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to during the appropriate section. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the city clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh. Here. Council members Farber. Here. Jones. Here. Resnick. Here. Roussel. Here. Sprank. Here. Wethel. Here. City Manager Van Milligan. Here. And City Attorney Brumwell. Here. Thank you. Mayor Cavanaugh, I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. I invite all who are able to please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will move on to presentations. Our first presentation is ICMA Wysilly Fellow Presentation. Good evening, Corey Burbach, I'm the Assistant City Manager, um, and I have the pleasure of doing two really fun presentations tonight. So the first one, we have a guest who has been in Dubuque, I can't believe this is his fourth week here already, um, Dr. Do Tun Tung, did I say that right? Okay, I've been practicing. <laughs> Um, Dr. Tung is with us through the Young Southeast Asia Leadership Initiative. Um, that is a program for those of you in the room who have been around for a while that we've hosted fellows in Dubuque for uh, many years and we're really excited about it. It is a program that has two tracks, um, one in governance and one in sustainability and young leaders from across Southeast Asia come to the United States to learn about those topics and bring what they learn back um, to their communities. So it's a program that is hosted in the United States by the US State Department, and it is managed by the International City Managers Association. So that's why we have the pleasure of hosting fellows here. Um, we have had fellows from all over Southeast Asia come to us through ICMA. We've also hosted fellows from Australia and from, uh, we have both sent staff from Dubuque to the Dominican Republic and had um, visitors from that country as well. Um, so Dr. Tung has been here studying sustainable agriculture for the past three weeks. Uh, we have one more week before he'll go back to Washington, D.C. for a week. Um, we've kept him busy, I think, with a combination of meetings, sometimes with you all or some of the staff in the room, to talk about the policy side of things and talk about uh, why community engagement is so important to sustainability. But then uh, we've been spending a lot of time looking at different scales of agriculture. So everything from some of our community gardens here in the city to visiting some of our neighboring um, farmers, organic farmers who are vendors at our farmer's market to visiting with um, some of the universities across the state to learn about um, practices that uh, Tung can bring back to his country. So Tung, would you like to say anything to council tonight? So good, even, good evening, everyone. So I'm uh, Do Tun Tung, I'm uh, from Vietnam. I'm a lecturer at the Taiwan University of Agriculture and Forestry. So I'm a YCD Fellows uh, 2023. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you tonight and I have a very good time for three weeks and 
you know, time flies so fast, so I have only one week to be <laughs> in the reviews. Uh, for the last thing, I think I want to say I'm very happy and thank you so much for the for your hospitality and very uh, friendly and have me like very good uh, experience in the view. Thank you so much. And I believe uh, via all of the awesome technology that we have that Tung's wife and daughter and son might get to see this. So I want to make sure that we say hello to them as well. And thanks for sharing their dad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, Dr. Tung, thank you very much for being here this, this evening and for being with us in Dubuque for so many weeks. I think uh, all of us, at least, if mo not most of us, have had a chance to uh, sit with you and get to know you a little bit. Um, and I hope you've, in it sounds like you've enjoyed your time and, and gathered a lot of great information which is wonderful, and I'm very happy that your wife and, and um, family were able to join tonight to be able to see this. I'm sure that while you've really enjoyed yourself, it's probably getting close to time to go home as well, so I can totally understand that feeling. But thank you so much for being here this evening and for being with us, so thank you. And let's all give uh, Dr. Tung a round of applause, please. Our second presentation is the 2023 Employee Spirit Awards recognition. Corey Burback, Assistant City Manager. Um, last meeting that we were at, you all recognized Public Service Recognition Week. So thank you for uh, the chance to share a little bit uh, more about some of our amazing staff tonight. Uh, so last week, I know that many of you were at our annual employee luncheon. And one of the things that we do at that luncheon is we give out what we call the Spirit Awards. So the Spirit Awards are a program created by our staff to recognize um, each other in the field. Sometimes they see things that might not make it to um, a way of being publicly recognized. So our staff can nominate each other in the values of the Spirit Statement. And Spirit Statement was created by staff to uh, identify the way in which we go about our work. So you all set our mission and vision for us every year and tell us what we're trying to achieve. And Spirit tells us as staff, how we go about doing that. So service, uh, SPIRIT stands for service, people, integrity, responsibility, innovation, and teamwork. That's how we get our work done every day at the City of Dubuque. And uh, we have a committee that reviews the nominations. This year there were almost 80 nominations. That's 10% of our workforce that was nominated because one of their colleagues saw them doing something amazing in the field. And that number alone is really exciting for me. Um, so we have a number of staff here this evening who were winners last week, and I'd ask them if they would come up um, to the front of the room so that when I read this list of awesome humans, uh, you can see what their faces look like. <laughs> Way up front. <laughs> All right, now not everyone was able to be here tonight, so I'm going to give you the full list of winners. Uh, but if you hear your name and you could give a wave to everybody, that would be awesome. So the service award um, stands for uh, staff that are responsive to the community. It's called the Consider It Done Award. And this award this year goes to Steve Faisal in the Leisure Services Department. The People Award recognizes the way that we care for each other and for the community. And we call this award the Highest of the High Fives Award. The People Award goes to Christina Snyder in the Housing Department. The first I in spirit stands for integrity. And this goes to an individual who represents honesty in all the work they do. We call it the Constant Contributor Award. And the Integrity Award this year went to Mackenzie Flanagan in the Health Department. And I believe it's her birthday tonight, which is a really good reason to not be here. I think she's out <laughs> celebrating. R stands for responsibility. We're accountable to the public and each other. And we call this the MacGyver Award. And it goes to Carla Escobar and Lena Barton, Lisa Barton, forgive me, in the Housing Department this year. The second I is the Innovation Award. And this is for um, an individual. And I should say, as you're hearing me um, give these awards, it can go to an individual or a team of folks. Uh, folks have the ability to recognize a group of folks as well. And so these are folks who look for a better way to get the work done. It's called the Big Bang Award. And it goes to Jesse Bernhardt in the Water Department this year. 
And then T stands for teamwork. We work together every day to get um, our work done, and we call this the Cloud9 Collaborator Award. Um, this year it was a big team, and it is a cross-department team, which is really fun to see. So this goes to the group of folks who did all of the work behind the scenes to hire uh, the staff for, to, to be able to open our two pools this year. So a lot of parents and kids are really excited about you all right now. <laughs> and it goes to Dan Kroger and Jana Bow in Leisure Services, Amanda Kopis and Keisha Doherty in Human Resources, Kristen Hill, Felicia Karner, Kelly Bukana, and Randy Gale in the Public Information Office. Um, so that's well spirit. You'd think that's the end of my awards, but it's not. Um, the committee came up with uh, another award the first year they developed this program, and we call it um, the Ultimate City Employee Award. So of all those nominations that come in under different letters, uh, we pick, we say one, but we've said two every year because they're so good and we can't get it down to one. Two awards that we call the Circle of Excellence winners, and those folks are the folks that um, quite often we read the nomination and we say, yes, that's one of the letters, but they're really exemplifying all of the spirit statement. And so we recognize those folks as the best of the best, so to speak. Um, so there are two Circle of Excellence Award winners this year. The first is Jody Lukens in our fire department. Um, and the second is the biggest team we've ever awarded uh, any of our awards to, frankly, but they have done a phenomenal job this year. And that is the public works team, along with some assists from our GIS department, uh, for the citywide tipper cart rollout. And you all have seen photos and videos and maps and know the numbers behind all of the work. Um, so we have a couple of our public works folks here tonight. Um, as part of your packet, you can see the letters that have all those nominations in, as can the public. Um, so I would really encourage you, if you know a city staff person or if you see one on the street, to take a minute and recognize them for Public Service Recognition Week. Particularly, join me in congratulating our spirit winners tonight. Thank you all for taking the time to be here tonight. We really appreciate the, the work you do every single day, and you can go ahead. It's fine. You're already, you're already there. You're already on the move. <laughs> Make it happen. So just, you know, I, I want to say that, um, you know, in a, in a time like now, when you think about public service and what that really means, um, you're, we're kind of in a place where we depersonalize it a lot. You know, we think of the government, the big bad government all the time. We don't think about the people that are behind that. We don't think about the human faces of the neighbors who live right next door to us that are doing this work every single day. And quickly becoming one of my favorite days of the year is the employee recognition luncheon that we have, where we go through two different lunches and be able to recognize all the employees who come through. And um, for me personally, you know, as a resident of Dubuque, I get to see, and we all get to see, how many people make this happen every single day. It's, it's a huge number of people, and they're all doing a very worthwhile, extremely important public service for all of us who live here. So thank you to every city employee and, and uh, everyone who's, who's there for the, the recognition, all the award winners for the extra work that you've done this year. Uh, we sincerely appreciate it, and we hope that we show that, and we hope that we continue to work as well to collaborate with you as we possibly can, but then also sincerely appreciate it as a resident of this city. It's a very good city that we live in, and thank you very much for making it that way. Adrian, thank you. We will move on to proclamations. Our first proclamation is Salvation Army Week. All right, well, Captain David M, is it Amick? Amick, all right, got it right. Yes, Captain David Amick is here to accept this proclamation with a, a team from the Salvation Army. If there's anything you'd like to say before I read the proclamation, you can feel free. Well, we'd like to say thank you uh, for this proclamation. Uh, we appreciate the fact that there's an acknowledgement of Salvation Army Week, and we want you to know that uh, we're here uh, to help the community. Uh, it's not about us. It's not about anything that we do. We want to make sure that we're giving back to the community. Mm. So. Well, thank you very much for doing that work and giving back to the community the way you do, and I'm glad we're able to celebrate this with you today with this proclamation. Thank you. City Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas the Salvation Army operates more than 7,500 centers in communities across the United States, including Dubuque, Iowa, and whereas the highly spiritual and humanitarian role of the Salvation Army has long been an important part of American life, and the Salvation Army of Dubuque has served the community for over 135 years. 
And whereas this week of recognition was first declared by President Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1954, 74 years after the Salvation Army arrived in the U.S., who stated in his proclamation, among Americans, the Salvation Army has long been a symbol of wholehearted dedication to the cause of human brotherhood. Their work has been a constant reminder to us all that each of us is, a na is neighbor and kin to all Americans, giving freely of themselves. The men and women of the Salvation Army have won the respect of us all. And whereas, through its welfare and religious institutions in our country, the Salvation Army has befriended, aided, and given new hope to men, women, and children, regardless of race or creed. And whereas, the Salvation Army of Dubuque provides services to the community through its client choice food pantry, mobile food pantry, pantry garden, senior activities, student activities, summer fan program, book club, Christmas food and toy program for children, church, emergency disaster services, the National Pathway of Hope program, which guides residents to achieve sustainable lives. And whereas the Salvation Army of Dubuque will host a ribbon cutting and pancake breakfast on July 1st at 10 a.m. to celebrate the arrival of its new emergency disaster services vehicle and EDS team to better serve service Dubuque and surrounding communities. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the week of May 15th through the 21st, 2023, as Salvation Army Week in the City of Dubuque, Iowa. Come on up. We can give him a hand. Our second proclamation is Kids to Parks Day. All right. The very popular Steve Faisal is here to join us today. <laughs> Good evening, Steve Faisal, Park Division Manager. Kids to Parks Day is a national day of outdoor play, celebrated annually on the third Saturday of May by the National Park Trust. This year, that is this Saturday, May 20th. The day is designed and intended to connect kids and families with their local, state, and national parks and public lands. 2023 marks the 13th anniversary of Kids to Parks Day, and I encourage all kids and families to go check out a local park trail or green space. The Parks and Recreation Commission has approved to waive the, waive the fee at Eagle Point Park this Saturday, so get out and enjoy the great outdoors. Well, thank you very much, Steve, for all the work that you do every day and for keeping those parks looking so good because it's that time of year, isn't it? That I mean, we're really year. enjoying them out there. I'm seeing kids in the parks every single day, so thank you for being here to accept this proclamation. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas May 20th, 2023 is the 13th Kids to Parks Day organized and launched by the National Park Trust held annually on the third Saturday of May. And whereas Kids to Parks Day empowers kids and encourages families to get outdoors and visit America's parks, public lands and waters. And whereas we should encourage children to lead a more active lifestyle to combat issues of childhood obesity, diabetes, hypertension and high cholesterol. And whereas physical activity is a key to good health and increased use of parks and green spaces is essential to health and wellness of children and adults. And whereas Kids to Parks Day will broaden children's appreciation for nature and outdoors. Now therefore I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council, staff, and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the 20th day of May 2023 as Kids to Parks Day in the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and urge residents to make time on May 20th to take the children in their household to a neighborhood, state, or national park. Our third proclamation is Public Works Week. The even, well, just as popular Public Works staff, right? Coming up here to accept this proclamation. Good evening. Thank you very much for your time tonight, recognizing Public Works Week. We're excited. Uh, we'll be at the Farmer's Market uh, next Saturday, so or this Saturday coming up. Uh, we hope you spend some time with us and uh, join us, but uh, Public Works Week really recognizes more employees than just Public Works employees. It recognizes all the employees that work on maintaining the infrastructure uh, and designing, so that would be engineering in Dubuque, 
uh, Water and Resource Recovery Center, Water Department, and the Park Division uh, in particular, those employees. So um, we thank you for your time. We'd like to uh, um, hope, hope we can see you all at uh, Farmer's Market this week. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, John. And of all the times to recognize this department, I think this is a great one. I mean, you have had a busy couple of months, have you not? So thank you very much for all the work that you've done with the tipper cart rollout, all the regular work you do, and then obviously making sure that flood wall kept the Mississippi River where the Mississippi River was supposed to stay. So thank you for all your work and for accepting this proclamation. City Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas the week of May 21st to 27th, 2023 has been designated as National Public Works Week by the American Public Works Association Association, with the theme connecting the world through public works to celebrate the vital importance to sustainable and resilient communities and to the public health, high quality of life and well-being of the people of the city of Dubuque via public works professionals focus on infrastructure, facilities and services. And whereas these infrastructure facilities and services could not be provided without the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are engineers, managers and employees at all levels of government and the private sector who are responsible for rebuilding, improving, and protecting our nation's transportation, water supply, water treatment, and solid waste systems, public buildings, and other structures and facilities essential for our residents. And whereas, it is in the public interest for the residents, civic leaders, and children in the city of Dubuque to gain knowledge of and to maintain an ongoing interest and understanding of the importance of public works and public works programs in their respective communities. And whereas we recognize that the services provided by the dedicated efforts of public works professionals who are engineers, managers, and employees at all levels of government and the private sector, and that the efficiency of personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the week of May 21st through 27th, 2023, as Public Works Week in the City of Dubuque, Iowa. Thanks, Randy. Our final proclamation is LGBTQ plus Pride Month. All right, we have Sarah Peterson, Indigo Channing, and Councilmember Danny Sprank here to accept this proclamation. And a few more people. And everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Peterson, Assistant Director at the Multicultural Family Center with the Leisure Services Department. Thank you so much for having us here today. This is some of our committee members that we've been meeting since September, I believe. Um, we have a great event coming up on Saturday, June 3rd. It's a block party and family picnic. It's in on 11th Street between Central and Iowa from 12 to 3 right after the farmer's market. So come on over and celebrate with us. We're super excited this year. And we also have the parking lot, lot next to that too. So all kinds of fun food and family friendly event, um, items. And yeah, do you want to say anything? Anybody else? Okay. Danny is speechless for one of the first times I've ever met Danny. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here this evening and for working so hard to make this possible. Um, the party was so big last year that you had to move it outside, I understand, so that's great. <laughs> Um, and thank you for the community for, for supporting this um, this day and Pride Month and uh, just for all the work that we're, we're all trying to do together. So thank you for being here to accept this proclamation this evening. Yeah. City Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas the city of Dubuque is a progressive and inclusive community that celebrates culture and heritage and supports efforts to ensure everyone has the right to live in conditions of dignity, respect, and peace. Where, and whereas the city of Dubuque strives to offer our residents a safe community and to put an end to taunting, bullying, and intolerance. And whereas the city of Dubuque advocates for the elimination of all forms of dis discrimination and displays a commitment to the equal treatment of all people, we recognize the need for intersectionality and work towards social justice as we understand there is no true equality until there is equity for all. And whereas the city of Dubuque understands the importance for LGBTQ plus people to have access to excellent health care in LGBTQ affirmative environments, the necessity to have the legal and institutional freedom to pursue their own lives as they wish, and the need to have their freedom and desire affirmed by the rest of the world. 
And whereas this proclamation in and of itself sends a positive message of validation to LGBTQ plus residents of Dubuque that the city embraces these individuals and their families as a part of the community. Now therefore I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, mayor of the city of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the city council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the month of June 2023 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month in the city of Dubuque, Iowa, and call upon the residents of Dubuque to observe this month with programs, activities, and ceremonies in recognition of our city's diversity, as well as the Pride Family Picnic and Block Party on June 3rd from noon to 3 p.m. held outside the Multicultural Family Center at the corner of 11th Street and Central Avenue. Yeah, everybody come on up. I'm a little taller than everybody, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. All right, Adrian. We will move on to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. And consent items can be found on pages two through five of the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. Do we have anyone here in chambers who would like to remove any of the consent items for a separate discussion this evening? All right, seeing no one, do we have anyone virtually? No virtually. All right, thank you, Corey. And no input received. All right, thank you. Bring it back to the table. I'd like to actually hold number 18, please, for separate discussion. Any others? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. Okay, I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended, except for number 18. Second, second by. <laughs> nice try. I got a motion by Resnick, second by Jones. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. So on to number 18. So I'm holding this because I wanted to just kind of open a discussion that I think is going to be an ongoing one. So this is a, um, a review of House File 718 and its impact on the city of Dubuque. I first want to say thank you very much to Jenny Larson, our CFO here in Dubuque, for um, being able to, for taking the time to do this and actually taking a look at what this impact is going to be. The reason I wanted to, to hold this is because I want to make sure that we're, um, we're making something clear as we move forward so that as this discussion occurs over time, it's not a surprise to anybody. Um, while I, like anybody else, very much appreciate the idea of being able to have some tax relief regarding property taxes, there's an effect that it's going to have on cities across the entire state. So this house file actually, um, in a number of different ways, is going to impact city budgets over the next few years. Um, and it's been, it's been very celebrated. I think it's important that we, we try to create tax relief when possible in our state. Um, but one of the things that's been challenging is that um, house uh, property assessments have gone up very high, very fast in the last couple of years. And I think it's been pretty scary for people. I know that, um, you know, I think, uh, I, I speak for most of us when we say that if you, if you own a home, you own some property, you've seen those assessments go up. I wanna make it clear too that those assessments don't mean that you're automatically gonna pay that much more in taxes. There are a lot of mechanisms in place in the state of Iowa already that affect how we pay property taxes and how those taxes are calculated. One of the things that this bill does point out though in this analysis that um, Ms. Larson has done for us, it shows that at the very least right now, we know for a fact that over $400,000 is going to be impacted in our city's budget going forward. And it's probably going to be more than that because there are gonna be some, some situations that basically take the rise in property assessments and knock those down a notch or two to uh, make it so cities don't have as much to work with. The reason that this is important that we talk about this out loud is because what that means is we are not going to be able to invest as much in the city of Dubuque as we would like to or as we might need to in years ahead, potentially. And this is gonna happen across the state of Iowa as well. So um, 
politically, there are a lot of different things that, you know, that are, are thrown back and forth about why these are good or bad ideas. But what I just want to make really clear as we start to talk about this is that this will impact the city of Dubuque's budget, and we need to be ready for it. There's just no way around that. We need to be prepared to know that we're not going to be able to invest as much as we would like to or as that we have in years past. So as we start talking about this from a budgetary standpoint and we start to think about um, what our goals are in August and how we're going to budget for those come February and March, um, this, this will have an impact. And, and as we have those discussions, I'll keep bringing this up and I'm guessing that the, the, uh, my city council colleagues will as well uh, because I want to make it really clear that some of these choices are out of our hands at this point. We're not able to do the things that we would really like to be able to do to continue the investment in this great community. Um, and, and a big reason for that is because of um, what has happened in this bill. So I look forward to, uh, and I want to, I, I see Ms. Farber over here waiting to say something too, but I, I do look forward to continuing to work with our legislators. Our local legislators here have been wonderful in sitting at the table and having discussions with us about the impacts and what this is going to mean for the city of Dubuque, uh, both before and after this bill was passed. So I want to make that really clear and I want to thank them publicly for their work with us. And I look forward to continuing those discussions because I do think that we have some hard ones ahead of us to try and figure out how this is going to impact our city and what it's going to mean for um, what we're able to invest in the future in the things that we really need here. So I just wanted to point that out and uh, make sure that we talk about it and, and start here because I didn't wanna just receive and file a bill and, just, and then the analysis of it and not really have a discussion about it. So thank you very much for that time. Ms. And, Farber. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up and for the socialization of the importance of uh, this change. Um, and I wanna also thank Jenny for all the hard work that she has done. Um, however, I do believe that we may want and think about um, a work session to better understand all of the intricacies and all the nuances of this new bill. Um, because there's just a lot there to unfold. And I think it would be educational not only for the residents of the city of Dubuque, but also for us as we go through our deliberations and just was wanted to tee that up as a potential for us to have at some point in time. I agree. I think that's a really good idea. And I know that we're not even close to being done with the analysis yet of everything that this, um, this could really uh, impact. I know the Iowa League of Cities is also working on how this is going to impact cities across the state. So as we do that, I do think it would be a good idea that we talk more about it and have a work session as we know more information. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. And be, be very clear, we've been calling this House File 718, but it's no longer a House File. This is the law of Iowa. It's passed the House, it's passed the Senate, it was signed by the governor. So it's, it's not just a bill anymore. We, we're so used to calling it that because we've been wrestling it for several weeks now, um, but it's, uh, it's now law. That's, so. that's a good point. Thank you, Mr. Jones. All right. With that, I would entertain a motion to be able to receive and file this, please. So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Farber. Second. Yeah, second by Mr. Jones. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. The motion passes 7 0. We will move on to items set for public hearing, and we have three. First is sale of city owned property at 1559 Washington Street for June 5th, 2023. Second is old highway road water main installation project, initiate public bidding and set the public hearing date for June 5th, 2023. And third is resolution setting a public hearing on a proposed development agreement by and between the city of Dubuque, Iowa and McCoy Group Incorporated LLC providing for the sale of city-owned real estate to McCoy, McCoy Group Incorporated and the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations pursuant to the development agreement for June 20th, 2023. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolutions, and set the public hearings for the dates specified. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Roussel and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Farber. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We will move on to boards and commissions. We have appointments for the Equity and Human Rights Commission and the Long Range Planning Advisory Commission. Okay, so the first appointment for the Equity and Human Rights Commission, we have one three-year term through January 1st, 2024, and we three, four, five, six applicants there. So what I will do is ask Adrian to please call the roll and each of us can name uh, the person we would like to appoint to this commission. If we have some sort of a tie, we'll go back to the table and figure that one out. Wethel. Michaela Freiberger. Resnick. Teresa Sampson-Brown. 
Roussel. Teresa Sampson Brown. Jones. Teresa Sampson Brown. Sprank. Teresa Sampson Brown. Farber. Teresa Sampson Brown. Kavanaugh. Teresa Sampson Brown. Uh, so Teresa Sampson Brown is appointed to the term on the Equity and Human Rights Commission through 2024. The second um, commission appointment we have is the Long Range Planning Advisory Commission. We have one three-year term through July 1st, 25, and one applicant, Cliff Conrad. So I will entertain a motion on this one, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move that Cliff Conrad be appointed to the vacant three-year term on the Long Range Advi Planning Advisory Commission. Second by Sprank. I got a motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Cliff Conrad is appointed to the three year term through July 1st, 2025, on the Long Range Planning Advisory Commission. We will move on to public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Public hearing number one is Municipal Services Center EV Charging Stations Project. Mr. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. Move that we receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Roussel. Got a motion by Farber and a second by Roussel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Public Works Director John Klosterman is recommending City Council adopt the resolution authorizing the approval of the plans, specifications, form of contract, and estimated cost of $134,670 for the Municipal Services Center EV Charging Stations Project. I concur with the recommendation and respect for the request, Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are on a public hearing to consider City Council adopt a resolution authorizing the approval of the plan specification form of contract and estimated cost of $134,670 for the Municipal Services Center EV charging stations project. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? Seeing no one, do we have anyone virtually? No. Okay. And no input received. All right. Bring it back to the table then for any discussion. Um, so Mr. Resnick. Thank you. Um, Yes, I read a lot about uh, different uh, charging systems, whether they'd be, uh, you know, uh, the way we're doing it now or in the future. So I'm, I'm hoping that someone maybe could talk to us about what they feel the long, the short-term, mid-term, and long-term prospects of electric vehicles are with all these different options that are being developed. Um, there are some there are some science writers who say that electric vehicles won't be around, but maybe 10 or 15 years, and others think they'll be here for the long term. So I'm just hoping that before we spend over $100,000, that uh, we're, we're pretty solid that these uh, electric vehicles are going to be around for a while. It'll be worth the investment. Thank you. Good evening, John Klosterman, Public Works Director. So as we look at the city fleet in total, um, it, right now we're gonna look at what we know is there. Right now there's electric vehicles, cars, uh, electric trucks are starting to roll out. And that's our focus, especially with this project here. Um, it's a phased in project, so we're gonna take our time and see how it goes, see how we can build our fleet. Um, there's continuous interest and a lot of work going on with larger fleet uh, that we would have in public works, mid-sized trucks, um, but uh, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, these charging stations won't be used for that, um, at least right now. A uh, future project could involve that. Uh, would probably take some more investment into the infrastructure in order to do that, but. Uh, in the same way that we looked at CNG and we, and we took a step towards CNG, uh, we're going to take that next step uh, toward electric vehicles. Great. And thank you very much. So we're responding to immediate need, which is important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Ms. Roussel. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, John, if perhaps you could give us some insights on how these electric vehicles help us with our greenhouse gas goals and, and how that benefits 
um, our community? Well, you know, one thing that we've always looked at as far as clean air, and that's we looked at a lot of different things. The, the coal plant is now gone, and it really comes down to the vehicles that we use, uh, not only in the city fleet, but overall in the city and the choices that we make. So, um, you know, we feel that electric vehicles definitely will take a step toward uh, the cleaner air um, than what our current uh, fleet system does. Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, um, Mike. Our sustainability coordinator, Gina Bell, is on virtual, if you would like her to respond. Sure. Yeah. Um, Gina, go ahead. Um, well, maybe she's just texting me and not actually on. <laughs> <laughs> she is communicating. Good answer, John. In a more modern way. Mr. Mayor. Uh, hang on one second, um, Barbara. We don't we don't have her on. Okay, we'll we'll see if she if she's able to join us or maybe Mike, you can fill us in here. I'm I'll move on to Ms. Farber here for a moment. So, Ms. Farber, just one quick question. And John, we had uh, discussed this previously. You had mentioned that these are going to be um, stations where you could actually um, fuel or fuel or charge, if you will, two cars at the same time, if I remember. Uh, and at one point, we had talked about accessibility for those of us in the public that have electric cars. And are we going to be able to use these? And if so, how would we pay for that usage? Yeah. So right now, these this project will just be for the city fleet. Okay. And that will, uh, in the same way that we charge back our, our gasoline and our diesel to the different departments, uh, these costs would also be charged back to the departments. Now, for the private sector, there are several uh, charging stations, or at least in the works, um, one down in the port area and, and one possibly even at, at this facility. So those projects are, are still being drawn up, and, and other locations are also being looked at. So. Um, more to come. Okay, thank you for that. I look forward to the more to come. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Roussel, I apologize. Did you did you have anything else? I stole the floor from you and gave it to Ms. Farber, but do you have anything else that you wanted to ask? Well, I, I just think it's important for our community to know that um, there are additional benefits of, of adding electric vehicles to our fleet that help us achieve our climate action goals um, that maybe aren't you know readily apparent when you're just looking at, at a particular cost, but uh, I think I think it's just important to keep that in mind. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Gina Bell is on now. Gina Bell's on now. Okay, uh, Gina, we're we're ready for you. Hi, Gina Bell, Sustainability Coordinator. My apologies for my technical difficulties. That's okay. Um, so I just want to say that you've you've covered a lot of what we've talked about in the Climate Action Plan. We want clean air. We want to reduce our greenhouse gases. We've set the goal, not only the overarching goal to reduce our greenhouse gases by 50%, but also we have a goal of 50% of electric vehicles within our city fleet by 2030, and um, also support and encourage alternative fuel vehicles. Um, and then we have community-wide goals as well. And all of that will help us greatly reduce our greenhouse gases, um, but then also those co-benefits that uh, Councilwoman Russell is talking about in terms of clean air and um, also we want to encourage active transportation and so it's all interconnected in what we're doing and the different efforts that we're putting forth and this is one part of all of that. Thank you very much Gina for adding all that. Mr. Mayor. Yes Mr. Jones. I, I own a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and I drive it around all day and do all my local errands on the electricity that I put into it overnight the night before. If I want to point it to Chicago or Des Moines, I steer it that direction and burn some gas and away we go. And it, uh, it's, it's by far the most efficient combination of things I've ever owned. When you look at the city fleet mission, it's mostly local running. Um, it's short trips around town. Um, it's a perfect, and it's a vehicle that's probably parked most of the night. It's a perfect uh, place for an electric vehicle. And uh, I appreciate the modesty of this proposal. We're looking at four stations. Um, we're looking at some vehicles, we're gonna learn what's going on. And, and everybody that's brought this up is right. There's a lot of technology brewing out there. I, my personal belief uh, from my research is that hydrogen fuel cells are probably gonna be the answer. But how quickly we can get to, to that answer is, is, uh, is still an unknown. Um, 
I thought that uh, compressed natural gas would be the fuel of this decade um, to get us to electric, but electric came very, very fast. And with all of the motor vehicle designers in the whole world frantically working to build the best battery and to build the best system and everything, we're pretty close to getting there. Um, I want to share a couple of uh, quick stats uh, from a New York Times article not too long ago. Um, it does say that EVs start with a bigger carbon footprint, but it doesn't last. And, and then they say, but that's just like your opinion. And they said, no, it's not. It's fact. Um, about 1.4 to 1.5 years for sedans, and you've completely overcome the production carbon that that EV has, has created. And from there on, it's about... 87 to 91% energy efficiency of the energy that you put in the vehicle coming back out in locomotion, in motion of the vehicle. Um, the internal combustion vehicle delivers about 16 to 25% into motion from the energy that you put into it. So it's explosively better um, in fuel economy and everything else. So these vehicles are gonna be more expensive. The charging stations, um, similarly to ex expensive to put in a gas pump, probably less expensive by far. Um, and I think that if we're leaders, we have to lead by trying things that others aren't. And that's, that's why I'm a big proponent of, of moving in this direction. This, this isn't a good answer yet for everything. I don't think we could reliably put police vehicles or fire engines out with electric power yet. They're built and they're, it's done, but I, I, think they're, I think the longevity of charge is not there for those applications. It certainly is for this application, for inspectors to go out and make the rounds and everything. And man, my... My car, just you get in it, you quietly go out of the garage, you drive it around all day, you plug it in at night. Um, my energy costs have dropped dramatically. My electrical costs have not gone up dramatically. I did put a level two charging station in my garage to support that vehicle. Um, but I'm having a real good time with it. I'm having an outstanding result with it. And I think this is a good move. And I'm glad it's a modest move because we might see fuel cells or some other thing that we haven't thought of yet coming around the, down the pike. And certainly, uh, the global research on battery technology is, uh, is coming fast and frantic, and it's getting better and better by the week. So things, things are changing, and that's the, the nature of our world right now. I'll just close quickly by saying uh, I just had a crew at my house that put up a new fence, and they used a lot of power tools, and they didn't have to plug one thing in in the two days they were there. Everything was battery, the sawzalls, the, oh, they burned a little gas on the driver that drove the posts in, but everything else was... Uh, Cordless, battery powered, and did a pretty great job, as is just about every other power tool in the world anymore. So it's a good move in a good direction. I'm sorry for taking so much time. Oh, that's, that's been right. working, been doing a lot, a lot, a lot of reading about this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Ms. Wethel. My goal is to always be a good steward with taxpayer dollars. And so when I simplify this for myself, my husband and I bought a house that was built in 1901, and the boiler, was quite inefficient. And so although we needed to invest quite a bit of money in buying a new boiler, we knew that in the long run, it would help us to have more efficiency in the winter months to heat our home. To me, this is no different than that in a long-term range in that our goal is to look at the money that we have to spend on our city vehicles and make sure that in the long term, we can be as efficient as possible. I would like you to speak just, if you would, Mr. Klosterman, to um, the collaboration that has happened with incorporation of EV vehicles and in the decision-making process for the future, because I've been impressed with it. What I'm thinking of is considering, yes, the cost of investment in vehicles and charging stations, but also the research that multiple different departments have done on efficiency on what the maintenance requirements would be, how we would train our staff in maintenance, as well as the necessity and how fire would need to be incorporated and even looking into how would we plan um, for a, an event such as a, a fire of a vehicle. So, and maybe um, that is a question for others as well, but. John, we can let Gina answer it if you want. Gina, is she on? Yep. Yeah, Gina Bell, if you're still on, would you? Go with that one. Maybe lost her. Okay. She, we, I think we lost her. Sorry. Loser. Uh, okay. Just can probably touch on probably a few of those things. I know that uh, Tony Breitbach and, and many others are looking at uh, 
the purchasing side for vehicles and you know what is the right cost of that, what the payback is on that. Um, on the training side for our, our fleet uh, technicians, which are public works employees, uh, Tom Keel has looked into that and what's the next step on that. It's hard to train on something until we have something uh, in place, but uh, in the same way, that's the same staff that, you know, researched and got the tools they needed and the training they needed to handle the CNG conversion that we have on a couple of trucks. Uh, I have full confidence that we'll do the same pattern and do the same thing to train those employees on electrical uh, vehicles. And I can tell you that our sustainability coordinator, Gina Bell, has led a, a citywide effort to research the, uh, the benefits of making this move and beginning this transition. And the mayor and city council made a major policy decision through the last year's budget process, and that was to give carbon a value. Um, so uh, we do have a goal. Uh, to reduce our carbon footprint 50% uh, by 2030. And that does have an economic impact, um, but so does the carbon. And so uh, the council agreed through last year's budget process to give that carbon a value. So that as we do our life cycle cost of our vehicles, that that, that is taken into consideration. And so I, I feel comfortable that we're doing the right research, we're finding out the right information and we're also implementing this in a responsible way. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. If I could just speak for a second to, to the fire risk. Um, it is substantial. A, an electric vehicle battery fire is, is a lot of fire. Um, a full gas tank can make a lot of fire as well. Um, but the instance is a little bit overreported. Um, it's a big deal when someone's Tesla burns down their house because it, it caught fire in the garage. It's, it's widely reported. Everybody hears about it. And everybody says, boy, Tesla's, Tesla's go up like birthday cakes. But it's simply, you know, the thing's just not true. About 1,530 incidents per 100,000 internal combustion vehicles catch fire each year. And only about 25 fires per 100,000 electric vehicles per year. So it's substantially less fire risk, but a more intense fire if you, and, and localized fire if you get one. Um, it's kind of like, like the pit bull question. Pit bulls get bad press. Every time they eat a kid, it's in the paper. But more Labrador retrievers bite people than, than any other dog because guess what? There's more of them. Um, mine hasn't bit me yet. Thank you, Mr. Jones. So I'll just, I'll just add my piece to this too. Um, and I want to begin by saying that I'm still upset that my car doesn't fly because Back to the Future told us that was going to happen in 2015 and it just never happened. So that is upsetting to me. However, um, we, we have been over the decades a leader on this, um, in, in this issue, on sustainability and uh, making sure that you know, we had a, um, a greenhouse gas reduction plan, a climate action plan. This council has made the climate action plan implementation a high priority for, or one of the high, higher top priorities for this year. Um, but frankly speaking, we're behind on this one. Uh, you know, I'm going to conferences at the, University, or the um, United States Conference of Mayors and National League of Cities. The coasts are way ahead of the Midwest on this, and large cities are way ahead of small cities on this. We're getting some assistance from the federal government to be able to implement this and have the finances to do it. Uh, but if we want to talk about where we're at as term, in terms of a leader, we're not in first place on this one. We need to catch up. And I would like us to see, I'd like to see us invest even more than this, but I completely understand that this is what we are able to do right now uh, because this type of infrastructure is a partnership. We can't build this electrical infrastructure ourselves in the city. We have to work with our uh, electric provider. We have to work with our, our county. We have to work with our community, our state, everybody to do this. But I'd like to see us push ahead. As, you know, as Mr. Jones said, if we want to be a leader, we need to lead. And, and I think on this issue, we need to do it. We've made this a priority. I think we need to go. And I'm hoping that we can go even faster as we go through this process. I do think we're going to see cost savings over time. I do think that we're going to see major environmental benefits over time. And the technology is going to catch up. You can't just depend on, you know, waiting for the technology to be exactly where you want it to be before you start to say go and start to build out this infrastructure. The technology is catching up, but it's, it's taken a little while, but we're, we're going to get there. Uh, car companies are moving in this place. 
it's time to go. So I'm really glad that we're doing this. I'm looking forward to, to voting for it. I know we've been laying the groundwork for this for a long time. Um, we did make that policy decision on uh, measuring the, the cost of carbon, and that's a, a part of all of this. And also our decision to make more of the fleet electric over time, um, not just within the, you know, the, the public works department, but all the departments. So hopefully we can keep moving that direction as the technology allows us to do so. But I do think, you know, the last thing I want to point out is our main barriers here are not logistical, they're political. That, that's really what it comes down to. It's, it's a matter of opinion. It's a matter of what you think you need to do moving forward. We need to get over that political hump and just push forward on the things that are going to be the best for the city of Dubuque. And I think that electrifying our city fleet is one of the things by far that we can do right now based on the information before us to be able to make sure that we are uh, reaching our greenhouse gas reduction goal and following our sustainability plan. So looking forward to moving this forward, hopefully. Any others? Okay. We have a motion by Farber and a second by Roussel to receive and file and adopt this resolution. John, thank you very much for helping us out tonight. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Public hearing number two is 2023 Pavement Marking Project. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second by Wethel. And a motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Engineer Gus Sahoyas is recommending City Council approve the plan, specifications, form of contract, an estimated cost of $226,693 for the 2023 pavement marking project through the adoption of the attached resolution. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider City Council approve the plan specifications form of contract and estimated cost for the 2023 pavement marking project uh, through the adoption of the attached resolution. Uh, do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? Seeing no one, do we have anyone virtually? No. Thank you. No one put received. Thank you. Back to the table for any discussion. Ms. Roussel. I know we do this annually and I never, I never think to ask. Um, Within the document, it says the the Iowa, uh, the state portion. I just wondered, how is that determined? How do we figure out how much of it is a, the state to pay and how much is ours? Steve, are you available to answer that question? Oh, oh I'm sorry, Gus Sahoyas is on virtually? Yep. Oh. Do you Gus want to do it? answer it better than I could. All right. Gu first. Gus Sahoya, city engineer, you want to address that? I'm going to see. He might be there. Someone labeled here as caller number one. No, it doesn't look like I can unmute him. It just says keep muted. Steve, you want to give it another go? <laughs> <laughs> just not having luck with the virtual answering today, are we? Steve Sampson Brown, project manager with the engineering department. So I can't give the exact f uh, funding split, but generally the, the funds come from the road use tax fund through the state of Iowa. So generally there's a formula in place. I don't know the exact okay. formula. I apologize. We can follow up with that tomorrow with additional information. Gus would know it if he's able to, but generally that's how it comes. So we do a local match and then we get uh, state funds. Thank you. Thanks. So it's formula driven that's, that answer your question then, Ms. Roussel? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Any others? All right, motion is to receive and file, adopt the resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. And Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number three is public hearing for sale of city owned property at 590 Clark Drive. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick? I move to receive and file and adopt the resolutions. Second. Motion by Resnick, second by Jones. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council hold a public hearing and approve the purchase agreement for 590 Clark Drive for the asking amount of $20,000 as presented. The property at 590 Clark Drive was acquired by the City of Dubuque by petition for title to an abandoned property on August 27, 2021 after a fire destroyed the previous structure in April 2021. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. 
Thank you, Mike. We are on a public hearing to consider City Council approve the purchase agreement for 590 Clark Drive for the asking amount of $20,000. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? Seeing no one, do we have anyone virtually? No, and no one put received. All right, back to the table for any discussion. Seeing none, motion is to receive and file, adopt the resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Public hearing number four is fiscal year 2023 second budget amendment. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick? I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Farber. Motion by Resnick and a second by Farber. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Chief Financial Officer Jennifer Larson is recommending approval of the second fiscal year 2023 budget amendment, which amends the fiscal year 2023 budget for City Council action since the first amendment to the fiscal year 2023 budget was adopted in October 2022. Adjustments to reflect new grants and reallocation of funding. A decrease in interfund transfers of $1,039,765 is also included. The amendment totals $2,970,333, an increased appropriation authority, and an increase in resources of $1,487,822. Additional revenues added in this amendment with offsetting appropriations are 14th Street Overpass Federal Grant of $2,280,000, the DRA Private Contribution for 14th Street Overpass, $750,000, Schmidt Island Trail Federal Grant for $615,000, Airport Construct Solar PV System Federal Grant for $306,543, the Mayor Court Grants for $51,974, and related private participation of $27,657. Economic Mobility and Opportunity Cohort Grant of $35,000, Public Works Asphalt Milling Reimbursements of $110,670, Housing Trust Fund Grant of $88,691, and Library General Gift Trust of $75,113. Reduced revenues reflected in this amendment with offsetting reductions in appropriations include U.S. 52 Central Traffic Implementation State Grants of, of $143,810, reduced to actual housing choice vouchers of $439,795, reduced to actual new downtown ramp bond proceeds of $2,186,822 with the project delayed. This amendment includes an increase of $344,248 for Community Development Block Grant or CDBG related programs. The increase in CDBG programs include Lincoln Elementary Wellness Program for $148,708, vacant abandoned buildings for $359, housing administration for $69,220, low and moderate income parks for $30,306, and aquaponic grants for $95,655. Decreases in CDBG programs include the target area for $1,963, property rehab for $121,176, housing grants for $16,649, low and moderate income park equipment for $148,709, Central Avenue corridor for $20,252, purchase resale and rehab $3,875, credit repair loans for $100,001, broadband for $100,000, IEDA St. John's $244,787 and City Manager's Office for $80,000. This amendment also includes $152,425 in Community Developed Block Grant CARES Act funds for Four Mounds Build Dubuque grants. In addition, this amendment corrects the budget for the sewer CCTV inspection, Force Main Air Release Project, and Cedar Terminal Assessments by adding the expenditure appropriation budget to offset the state revolving fund loan revenue budget of $1,247,303. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider city council approval of the second fiscal year 2023 budget amendment. Do we have anyone in chambers to address us on this item? I see no one. <clears throat> Any virtual? No. 
Thank you. No input received. Thank you. Do we have any discussion? Okay. Seeing none, the motion is to receive and file, adopt this resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Bethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We will move on to public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address when the Mayor asks if there is any in-person input. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. We have any public input this evening? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the council, city manager Mike Van Milligan, most excellent staff and city servants, public servants. Um, uh, my name is Rick Dickinson. I reside at 205 Hill Street. I have the pleasure of serving as the president of Greater Dubuque Development Corp Corporation. As far as uh, uh, public comments, uh, I have two things I wanted to touch on. First of all, I want to thank you for your vote on the charging stations. Uh, Dave Lyons from our office works very closely with the city on strategic initiatives and sustainable practices in our, in our community because it makes us a community of choice because being a community of choice helps us recruit, retain, and create the workforce that we desperately need in the Midwest, in Iowa, and certainly in Dubuque. But perhaps most importantly, uh, conversion to electric vehicles not only addresses the issues of climate change, which is real, but it improves the quality of air that our children and our grandchildren breathe every day. The city's done a wonderful job with the reduction of particulate matter in the air, the little fuzzy stuff that's flying around that gets into our lungs and, again, into our children and our grandchildren. Uh, there was a time just 10 years ago when we were approaching non-attainment, meaning that our particulate matter in the air in Dubuque, Iowa, was getting so high that we were going to be restricting businesses' ability to expand our community because we couldn't contribute any additional pollution in the air parts per million, particulate matter. But the city stopped burning its sewage and paid for a state-of-the-art water resource recovery center. And Alliant Energy converted from coal to natural gas and eventually eliminated that production facility in our community altogether. And now it has dropped dramatically. The quality of air in Dubuque is as good as any place, if not better than any place in the Midwest. But smog, smog is on the rise. And smog can only be addressed by conversion to EV vehicles. You're right, it is a modest step. Dave Lyons has been working with your team to try to find, turn every stone to find dollars to expand charging stations and conversion to electric vehicles. I urge you to be much more aggressive than you have been. I know you want to be. I know it, it has to include the cost of carbon but I urge you to work continually with Dave and your team to expand EV charging and vehicles. Don't buy another gas small vehicle in this town. Let's have it be an example of EV charging and electric vehicles. Secondly, I want to thank uh, the city manager and staff uh, for a project that was uh, just set as a public hearing for the McCoy project. It was announced uh, several weeks ago that McCoy intended to purchase the McGraw-Hill building located in the port of Dubuque. There were some things that had to happen for that to become a reality. Yes, they had an option to purchase, conditional on making sure that it would work for their employees. And oftentimes we criticize government because things take too long or uh, you can't come to agreement on things, but I just want to tell the citizens of Dubuque that this issue was brought to the city manager and his staff, the need to acquire parking space, the need to uh, work out some details on the repurposing of the McGraw-Hill uh, facility for 
McCoy Group, one of the fastest growing companies in our community, and it didn't happen in a matter of months. It didn't happen in a matter of weeks and weeks. It happened in a matter of days. It's before you, you set a public hearing, and I hope that you can approve it on June 20th. I just wanted to say thank you. Well, thank you, Rick, for your comments. Any other public input this evening? Seeing no one else here, any virtual input? No. Okay. And no input received. All right. Then we can move on to action items, please. Action item number one is Destination Iowa Outdoor Recreation Fund Grant, Iowa Amphitheater on Schmidt Island. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and approve. Second by Sprank. Motion by Resnick. And a second by Sprank. Mike, please. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Project Manager Steve Sampson Brown is recommending City Council approval for the City Manager to execute the Destination Iowa Outdoor Recreation Fund grant. And this is a uh, project to build an outdoor amphitheater on Schmidt Island. The total project costs are $15,442,961. The Destination Iowa grant request was $5,784,961 and the city was awarded uh, $3 million instead of the full grant request amount. As part of the grant application, the city had agreed to issue $6 million in downtown urban renewal debt with the DRA making the debt payments. With the reduced grant award, the city would now be agreeing to issue downtown urban renewal debt in the amount of $8,784,961, and the DRA would be agreeing to make this increased debt payment. I concur with the recommendation and respect for the request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? Come here. Ms. Farber. If I could ask Krenna if I need to recuse myself from this vote. No, you do not. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Resnick. Very quickly, this is very important for our one of our top and high priorities of the uh, Schmidt Island, and um, we're making that a world-class location. So I'm, I'm looking forward to voting for this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. Yeah, Mr. Sprank. I can just picture in a couple of years when it's done. No more, the backwater stage won't be in a parking lot. It'll be here. So that's <laughs> what I'm looking forward to when it's finally finished. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, it's very exciting to see pieces fall into place uh, for Schmidt Island and what it can be. Uh, we are, I know, working very hard to try and make this a destination, and obviously with the Destination Iowa grant to be able to do this piece of it, it's very important. So uh, thank you for everyone who had who's worked on this, and thank you to the DRA for this continued partnership. All right, well, motion is to receive and file and um, approve. So, I'm sorry. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Carber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number two is St. Anne and Avalon Intersection Reconstruction Project. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. We will receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second. Motion by Jones and a second by Roussel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Engineer Gus Soyes is recommending City Council award the public improvement construction contract for the St. Anne and Avalon Intersection Reconstruction Project to offset construction LLC in the low bid amount of $207,547.60 through adoption of the attached resolution. I concur with the recommendation and respect the request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? I see none. Motion is to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number three is proposed amendment to the 2020 National Electrical Code. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting of which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Wethel. And a motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Assistant Housing Director Michael Belmont is recommending City Council approval 
of amendments to the City of Dubuque Code of Ordinances, Title 14, Building and Development, Chapter 1, Building Codes. The National Electric Code, or NEC, is a model code which covers electrical installations for both residential and commercial construction. To propose revisions to Section 334.10 would allow NM Cable, or Romex, to be installed in multifamily residential construction above the second floor in certain types of construction. This aligns with the unamended National Electrical Code. After staff review of the codes was completed, the proposed amendments were brought to the Building Code Advisory and Appeal Board for review and input. The Building Code Advisory and Appeal Board is a seven member board tasked with reviewing proposed code adoptions for recommendation to the City Council. On May 11, 2023, the Building Code Advisory and Appeal Board held a special meeting virtually and voted to recommend approval of the proposed changes with no additional comments. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? Mr. Resnick. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, the, our next item, it talks about an international code. And so I'm just wondering, we have the National Electrical Code and we have the International Code and, and there's some differences in that. And uh, did you, what you talked about in your memo uh, about the, uh, about that specific type of wire being uh, used above the second floor, is that the difference or uh, are the codes different uh, and does it, is it uh, different that matters or not really? I, I appreciate the input that our uh, committee gave us. But I was just wondering, sometimes we, we cite one code and sometimes we cite another, and I guess I, uh, there's no reason to be consistent with the codes. Uh, so those well, are- I do believe we are consistent, but I'm gonna ask uh, our building official, Michael Belmont, who uh, interacts with the code board to answer, respond to your question. Uh, Assistant Director Mike Belmont, Assistant Director of the Housing Department. Uh, to answer that question, the, uh, the international codes is a series of codes that has everything except for the electrical. The electrical, electrical code is the NEC code. Uh, that's a national standard. Everybody uses that. Uh, the international codes does not have an electrical version of the codes. So our, what we're using right now is not compliant with the national code? No, so we, we have been using the uh, NEC or National Electrical Code for many years. And in fact, the, in 2021, we adopted the 2020 NEC. Um, this is a revision to uh, an existing amendment that we have for the NEC. So they change, so we change. Uh, this amendment, this, the amendment that we had would not allow NM cable above the second floor. Um, we went, what we're asking to do is go back to the unamended language in the NEC, which allows NM cable above the second floor. See, so we're going to, we, we'd like to keep it the way it is. That's correct. Um, and we've determined that that's not a safety issue. Uh, that is correct. Great. Thank you very and, much. And the other piece I was just going to add is the NEC is what's adopted by the state of Iowa as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Ms. Roussel. I'd just like to state that I was glad to see that the um, advisory board um, had reviewed this with no additional comments because that is a, a board made up of people with great expertise and when they bring something to us, I, I think that's really important. And I also like the fact that you responded to some of their comments about making sure that we have um, um, licensed people doing the work so I was glad to see that there's going to be more efforts towards that as well. So I found the memo to be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roussel. Yeah, and I know we have, um, not to move ahead too fast, we have a number of issues here that involve um, codes and uh, enforcement and some amendments to different pieces in the, uh, looks like the Building Code Advisory and Appeals Board was hard at work along with you, Mike, and your staff. So thank you very much to everyone who serves on that board and uh, for your work on all this to, to make this all come before us. Yep, thank you. Thank yes, you. They, did, they did a lot of work on this one. It's a lot of codes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, over a, a number, of, number of weeks and months it looks too. So thank you. All right, well, the motion here is to receive and file and waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move final consideration and pass it to the ordinance. 
Second by Wethel. Got a motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number four is adoption of the 2021 International I Codes. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and further move that requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Sprank. I got a motion by Roussel and a second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Assistant Housing Director Michael Belmont is recommending City Council review and adopt the proposed amendments to the City of Butte Code of Ordinances, Title 14, Building and Development, Chapter 1, Building Codes, 2021 International I Codes. I concur with the recommendation and respect the request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. This, this is a lot of, lot of stuff in, in one, uh, one sweep, but uh, I guess I just want a quick comment on a piece of the fire code that um, is in the national code or the international code, but is not in our Dubuque code, and that is residential sprinklers. And I understand why it's not in there yet. It's, uh, we, we have to draw, decide if it's uh, if the cost is worth the benefit. I think it is. I heartily think it is. The folks that write the codes think it is. Um, the concern is that we also have a problem with not enough housing in Dubuque, and that if we require that, nobody else does it. New housing isn't going to happen in Dubuque, so I get the concern to it. Um, we learned during the fire station relocation study that was done 10 years ago, and I think it'll be repeated, that the, um, that the density of the fire service that exists downtown probably can't exist in the rest of the city. And the density of the population that exists downtown doesn't exist in the rest of the city. Um, and that the success of, of uh, keeping the community fire safe in the future will be in code enforcement along with good fire suppression and prevention methodology. So if we have uh, better building codes and building safety codes, we have less risk of people dying in, in house fires, plain and simple. Um, it's pretty well known um, in fire safety research that a residential sprinkler will be quite a multiplier in the amount of time you have to get your shoes and socks and pants on and get out the door when your smoke alarms go off. Um, it's not like you see in the movies where a sprinkler goes off and the whole building is flooded. Um, they're local. The sprinkler under the fire goes, or above the fire goes off. Um, it's kind of dirty water. It makes a mess, but it puts the fire out. It keeps you from getting killed. Um, so I, I think that it's time to start moving towards that level of code. Um, if we're, once again, if we're going to be a leading community, we have to lead. And this is an area we've chosen not to lead it. I, and I, I totally get the why. It's really important that people build here. And we've got really we've got better codes than we've ever had, so we're building better better residential structures than we've been for a while. But I, I really think this is a missing piece that just needs some conversation, not tonight, but down the road. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Well, I do appreciate you bringing that to our attention. It's something to think about as we continue to have these discussions down the road. Um, you know, as you said, maybe tonight's not the time for that, but to be able to think about the pros and cons of that going forward, I think, sounds to me like an important discussion to have. I want to be respectful to the work that's been done to get us to here tonight, because I know it's, it's, a, it's a big vibe. And that's a tough call. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a tough call when we have that conversation. Certainly. Yep. OK. Any other discussion? So we have multiple ordinances here, and the uh, motion is to receive and file and waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Roussel? I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Sprank. I got a motion by Roussel and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number five is adoption of the 2021 Uniform Plumbing Code. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage of two council meetings prior to the meeting at which is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Farber. And a motion by Jones and a second by Farber. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Assistant Housing Director Michael Belmont is recommending City Council review and adopt the enclosed amendments to the City Debut Code of Ordinances, Title 14, Building and Development, Chapter 1, Building Codes, Article H, Plumbing Code. 
I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? I'm seeing none. All right, motion then is to receive and file. Waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Jones? I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Wethel. We got a motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number six is amendment to ordinance 14-9-1 swimming pools. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and further move that a requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second, second by Sprank. Got a motion by Roussel and a second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Assistant Housing Director Michael Belmont is recommending City Council review and adopt the enclosed amendments to the Dubu City Dubuque Code of Ordinances, Title 14, Building and Development, Chapter 9, Swimming Pools. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you, Mike. Any discussion? I do feel the need to ask a clarifying question on this one. So this, this appears to be a... a, a a minuscule but very important language shift is what I'm seeing. Is that is that correct? So, Mike, if you wouldn't mind addressing that for us, just it, it sounds like there's a, a just a, maybe one or two words that have been changed in this code to to clarify things a little more. Uh, Mike Belmont, Assistant Housing Direct Director. Yes, that that's correct. Um, that one word, capable of containing 24 inches, is important um, because we did have we did have someone approach us with the definition as written and say, hey, if I drain my pool to 24 inches or less then it's not a pool anymore. And uh, you know that's, that's obviously a potential safety hazard and uh, that's not something that we want to, uh, to allow. And it also aligns the, co the language in the IPMC with the ordinance language definition of a pool. Thank you. Once again, I appreciate people reviewing this so often so we're making sure that we get these things right because language is important in cases like this, so thank you. Thank you. All right, motion then is to receive and file and waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Roussel? I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Sprank. Motion by Roussel and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We'll move on to council member reports. Any reports this evening? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Next week on Monday and Tuesday, there are honor flights that leave and return to Dubuque. And uh, folks are invited to come to the airport um, both of those evenings to welcome these heroes home. Um, so you have to be at the airport at 9 o'clock for a security and safety briefing. And the flights arrive at about 10 o'clock PM. But both Monday and Tuesday, there'll be groups of Dubuque, Dubuque heroes returning home. Um, from a pretty intense day, and be kind of cool. Some council members could be there to, to help shake their hands. There'll be a lot of people there. It's a big deal. Thank you very much, Mr. Jones. Appreciate that. Any other reports? Anybody listening, by the way, that's not limited to us. If you're listening to this thing and you want to come out there, Mike, please come out there. Anybody can go. Thank you. Well, the only thing I would say is that if you haven't been to the farmer's market yet, I think you're the only person in Dubuque because <laughs> the last two weeks have been absolutely packed. So it, you know what's great, though, is to see people getting out and really enjoying each other in, in the community in this way. Um, Saturday morning, farmer's market. We had night market last Thursday. It was absolutely packed with people. Um, saw a number of you down there and just it really have enjoyed seeing everybody. So I hope that um, I'm excited that the weather's here. We're getting out into the community and doing some more fun stuff, but uh, go out and enjoy some of those events out there. All right, well, I see we have a closed session. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move that the council go into closed session in accordance with Chapter 21.5 of the Code of Iowa to discuss pending litigation and purchase or sale of real estate. Second. Got a motion by Jones and a second by Resnick. Uh, for the record, the attorney the city council will consult with on the issues to be discussed in closed session is City Attorney Krenna Brumwell. 
Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Wethel? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Farber? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We are in closed session.